So, okay, let me hand over. Um, so we are doing it together, but Chris, Christophe is the lead on that. So I'll let him introduce the topic and I pretend I know everything. So, um, hello, everyone. Uh, very happy to be here today to, um, to coordinate this workshop where actually you will be working and I will be sitting back. So the idea is that this is as interactive as possible. So the, the setting is not ideal, I would say. It's better to be, so you might want to turn around a little bit just to, to make sure, uh, that you, uh, that you exchange and interact because, um, you, you will see or you have um, maybe looked at it. So it's, uh, we have like very concrete uh, case studies we're, we're going to run through. And, um, and basically I'm sure that you have most of the answers. So um, that uh, will, that will be even easier than for, for me. I don't have to speak. Um, but before we do that, what I suggest is we will, um, can we move to the next slide, please? We'll do a round of introduction by just introducing, oh, this is really hot here, um, the objectives of, of the workshop of today. Um, so you're in the NITAG workshop. I think you're all in the right place, hopefully. Um, so basically, um, you see the objectives. First of all, it's to identify the factors that are to be considered in making uh, recommendations. Um, to identify the key stakeholders and how they interact with NITACs and discuss their, their roles in decision making. And that includes, um, a number of, uh, of diff different stakeholders. And, um, then third objective is to describe some of the factors affecting the credibility and the performance of NITACs. Um, we'll have a, a bit of discussion around uh, evaluation and uh, self-evaluation um, and how this uh, might help to improve your the performance of your NITAC. And then actually any other point you would like to raise. Um, so um, you have maybe special interest in being in this group. And obviously as we are more towards the end of the workshop, the uh, networking I'm sure has already taken place quite a lot. But um, we will um, continue that under the NITAG um, perspective. Uh, but first, to start with, maybe I'll, I'll introduce myself. And then um, <coughs> probably, you know, well, I've been in your seat five years back. And by the end of the course, I still couldn't remember all the names. So I'm not sure that you do, but we'll practice again together. So I'm Christoph Steffen. I... I'm working at WHO in the SAGE Secretariat, and um, I've been there for the past uh, five years. I have, um, in, in a previous uh, life, worked also with um, an NGO, um, AMP, with Kamel, actually, a few, a few years back uh, then um, in the area of uh, vaccination, and um, I was involved in, in flu. Um, and... Um, well, and I have a few other um, hobby horses, um, uh, which uh, which I'm not going to go, uh, but I, I worked a bit for the, the European Commission and um, more recently, actually not far away uh, from here in the, uh, the, the general uh, hospital in Annecy. Um, so actually the NITAC support in WHO is based in our small um, uh, unit that is dealing with policy. So it's the SAGE Secretariat, but we also um, support uh, mainly via our regional offices, um, uh, NITAC activities, um, uh, strengthening and um, whatever is, is required. Let me um, hand over or go around the table. I'll, um, I don't know, you keep the, shall we, um, is the mic going around? We have a mic. Okay. You all have a mic. So I might take some notes. So yeah, let's, let's, um, so basically we have, um, Kamal, we have one and a half hour. Yeah. A bit less now, but uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we'll be quick. Could you just introduce yourself in, in one or two sentences and, and maybe tell us or me why you are uh, particularly interested in ITEX? 
Uh, hello, I'm uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm Alfa Yellow. I'm from in some Paris. Uh, I'm involved in uh, clinical trial, vaccine clinical trial, uh, uh, sponsored by INRS and also INSERM and the Vaccine Research Institute. Thank you. Uh, hello, I'm Trina Rassin. I'm Director of Vaccine Development at a research organization called VITO, the Vaccine and Infectious Disease Organization. So my responsibilities are to help bring the discoveries that our scientists make um, into the clinic and into field trials for our vet vaccines. So I'm interested in, in this discussion just to see if it, you know, understanding the roles of the NITAGs and how they make their decisions will help influence how we discover and develop vaccines. Hi, I'm Catherine. Um, I work as technical director for the Malaria Consortium, which works on uh, infection prevention programming and operational research um, across a host of childhood uh, infectious diseases. Previously, I had um, supported NITAG decision making in Ethiopia for Rhoda and pneumococcal uh, vaccine introductions. Um, and so I'm interested in yeah, supporting decision making broadly and how that process works. I am Sri Jana and I'm a pediatrician and working on some clinical research, research, especially on uh, pneumococcus and typhoid. So we have been working on generating local data to have a policy implication in the national decision making regarding vaccines. So I really want to see what exactly will be in the national, uh, the NITAG working for uh, looking, looking the evidences and analyzing. So that's why I'm here in this. Hello, I'm Farzana from India. I am an academician and also we are looking into the implementation of RI activities in our districts and state as a whole. And also I am uh, look into some clinical trials uh, of uh, various vaccines. Maybe as a member of uh, NITEC, I as a public health specialist, I may look into the evidences what NITEC is uh, actually looking into the for uh, any decisions what they're taking going to take uh, for the country. Hi, I'm Victoria. Um, I'm a pediatrician too and an epidemiologist. And um, I'm on the um, RSV working group of our NITEC. So this will be a first time for me to directly support them. So this is why this is interesting too. I am Tan Yui from Thailand. I'm a pediatric infectious disease. I do a clinical trial in pediatrics. And also be uh, invited sometimes to, uh, during, especially during COVID, to be like expert for the night time. Uh, hi, I am uh, John Mark Velasco from the Philippines. Um, I'm interested in, in the role of NRAs, um, you know, uh, specific roles of NRA, NRAs for night time. Hi, I'm Meiru Shio from the University of Sydney. I'm an epidemiologist and work mostly in low and middle income countries. Nice to see you again, Christoph. And um, particularly interested in data for decision making, but also currently um, involved in teams supporting Lao NITAG strengthening and the Pacific NITAG scoping exercise. Um, hi, I'm working at the School of Medicine in Rabat. I'm actually the director of the Social Accountability Unit. Uh, two years ago, I made the evaluation of the NITAG, Moroccan NITAG, and um, I attend this workshop to be able to uh, design uh, the step forward to better strengthen the NITAG and uh, to make him more socially accountable. Uh, so, hi, I'm Santosh. I'm with the EPI team in WHO headquarters. But in my previous experience, I've worked with the country uh, just serving as a secretary to the NITAG in, in just the evidence decision-making process, right? Hi, everyone. I'm Ia from Guinea. So I'm a public health physician, currently supporting the EPI national program. And uh, we are looking forward to introducing few vaccines, <laughs> namely on the rotavirus, H PCV, and uh, HPMB for infants. So I'm really looking forward to... Um, having more experience about the night time. Hello, I'm Mariam Silva Marquez from Timor Leste, currently as the chair of the night time for my country. So why well, you choose this workshop to observe how night work from other countries? Thank you.
Hello, I'm Sophia. I'm an epidemiologist. I am new to industry. I was with the CDC before, and so I'm familiar with the ACIP, but I would love to learn more about NITAX in other countries. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Natasha. I am with WHO Country Office, New Delhi, India, and I'm looking after uh, routine immunization in urban populations. So my, as a program manager, I would like to know how ITAGs, they work and uh, how decision making is done. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Cynthia Wiley. I'm an associate professor in the Division of Infectious Diseases at Emory, so primarily an adult infectious diseases practitioner. And I also do a good bit of um, implementation of clinical trials. So I'm really interested in kind of hearing about what happens during this entire process, um, you know, because it, you know, really impacts how I take care of my patients. Um, hi, I'm Tadello. I'm a pediatrician. I work for the Ministry of Health of Lesotho, so I function as ex officio uh, um, secretariat for NITEC. Hi, Gonzalo from Argentina. I lead an organization which conducts large-scale clinical trials, and I'm part of two committees in, in our scientific society in Argentina that they ask us always for recommendations. So I think to, to, to learn about NITEX could improve the work that we are doing there. Hi, I'm Cristiana, I'm from Italy, I'm from industry. I'm working mostly in uh, CMC development. So I'm very far from all these topics, but I'm really curious to know where vaccines that we develop are distributed. So I'm really here to learn more. Thank you. Hi, I'm Monica from Brazil. I work in a public uh, research center and uh, institute that we have research, manufacture, and so I'm interested to know how this process happens. Hi, I'm Ulrike. I work for industry. I um, have been involved in many preparations from our side uh, for NITAC, especially ACIP engagement. Um, yeah, I mean, ACIP is for me, my current role, the, mo the uh, most uh, important one, but obviously I yeah, have other NITEX engagement. For me, it's also interesting, similar to Sophia, to learn about, you know, what, what on a WHO level, how do we think about it and, you know, how are considerations made in other countries um, outside of the States. Hi, I'm Anna from the Netherlands. I'm an uh, adult ID specialist uh, clinician, and I do clinical um, vaccine trials, mostly focus on dose pairing and more immunological vac of, uh, or vaccine responses. And my work mostly ends at the publication, <laughs> so I really want to learn what happens uh, afterwards. Hi, my name is Alisa Kachikas. I work, um, I'm from the U.S. I do mostly research, uh, translational research in vaccines and infections in pregnancy. And I'm involved in some um, panels and work groups on the state level and starting on the national level. So I'm very interested in hearing what um, happens from the kind of the overall um, zoomed out picture. Hi, I'm Matthias from WHO HQ. I work on vaccines in development, but the reason why I joined this workshop because I really wanted to understand the decision-making process at an ITAC level and how it can translate into developing development vaccines. Hi, I'm Laura. I'm from Belgium. I work at the Public Health Institute in surveillance, um, and in that role I've joined the NITAC during the COVID crisis, and I'm still uh, part of the NITAC, and I find it's quite challenging. <laughs> So I'm interested to learn uh, what the best practices are or how other countries do it. I'm from Italy in industry, which is completely far from my field. I'm a vaccine development leader. And so how you make decisions, who makes them, how you get to the end of that, that is something that is unique. I'm Jamil. <clears throat> and um, I worked more than 15 years ago in a program that was set to support uh, countries to establish NITAGs or to strengthen NITAGs and also to develop the collaboration between NITAGs. It was called the CIVAC Initiative. It was uh, funded by Gates Foundation and it was working closely with WHO and countries. Okay. Let's, let's get going. So, 
we'll run you through. We have six different scenarios, and we have more or less fifteen minutes, less per per well. Ten. Okay, this first scenario. So they are all invented, but uh, close to um, some real life experience. So whole cell pertussis vaccine has long been used in your country. The national program is considering changing to a new a cellular vaccine that has recently been licensed. What kind of data should be looked at? You want an answer or do you just should be split in this? No, we'll, we'll, so we have 12 minutes. We'll go, we'll do each scenario after another and we'll cover quite a bit of, um, the questions you might have around NITAX and starting with data, data requirements, et cetera. So who wants to, yeah, please. So, um, disease burden and uh, epidemiology in countries that have switched from whole cell to acellular, so looking at the impact of that switch on uh, diseases and outbreaks. Okay. Epidemiology, disease. Yep. Yes, please. Uh, maybe other than disease and epidemiology, we also need to look into the facts that why we need to switch to the acellular one, because what was the reason uh, any look into the any AFI uh, previous, uh, so maybe these uh, these are the things also we need to look at. Coverage of the vaccine, yeah. for example, just on this population, I mean, I yeah, know absolutely different vaccines, but maybe when I look at that, yep. well, the efficacy, safety. efficacy, safety. Waning of immunity, yes. Supply. Supply. Logistical Cost. advantage. Programmatic advantage. Yeah. Right. Acceptance by the population. Right. Use the microphone, please. Because there are some people online. Uh, maybe if you get some information on the seroprevalence, would that help in in terms of the existing seroprevalence with the whole cell proteases in the country? Would, you know, if if that evidence, if that information is available. But why do you need seroprevalence yes. if you? I mean, you can look at disease burden rather than seroprevalence. No? What would that tell you? If, it, if you don't see any. Okay, outbreaks, yeah. Right. What about the availability of combined vaccines for the newly licensed one? Because usually diphtheria is, or pertussis is included in a combined vaccine. So if you're trying to go to a penta or something, you know, that Absolutely. Would be yeah. valuable. You also need to know the licensure status and the label. Uh, they indicate the licensure status in your country and the label. Oh, one more important. One more important uh, point I just want to add because uh, is there any deficiency? Is there any stoppage of the supply of the wholesale wholesale produce so that we are going into the new uh, like a cellular one supply chain? How about the cost? Yeah. Does the cost, yeah. consider cost? I'm asking. I don't know. Yeah. More and more, I think. Actual, actual stockage that that you can have from the other vaccine. But I would echo the comment on cost because I think it's it's uh, differs highly between NITEX, right? Like ACIP is, uh, I think, specifically instructed not to look at cost effectiveness. Yeah. Whereas well, in other countries, it's partially. probably one of the most expensive documents for cost effectiveness that are submitted in ACIP. Yeah, so not a but they don't have like a threshold, so they it shouldn't be their thing to recommend or not. What is ACIP? The American US, US NITEX. Ah, the US NITEX. Uh, you might also want to see some country examples if any countries have kind of done this transition. That's one. And yeah. the second thing is also, um, well, I just forgot. Maybe I'll come back. <laughs> the voice of the like um, parents or the the voice of the population. Okay. 
the programmatic implications with the switch of this uh, vaccines in terms of operations in the country yeah last question probably do we really need it <laughs> well that's that's an excellent question to start with okay Vaccine should it should be only the child, or also it could be like a booster in the other interval of age. I guess looking at population impact in countries that might have introduced and what the anticipated. I guess what what the reason for change is, but also then what the impact will be longer term, and is that what you're looking for? And acellular is, is more no whole cell is more reactogenic, right? So maybe perceptions of this reactogenicity in the population. Um, but is there any context to this, or if we just introduce vaccine like that? To me, to me, that should be a context, right? The reason why we want to change from a cellular to a whole cell. Yeah. yeah, that's a good question. Um, it doesn't say in this example, but uh, um, um, yeah. Um, again, d does that also relate to that in different settings? Some countries, it'll be dependent on if a pharma company comes and submits a, a vaccine application, whereas in others, they might proactively look at a change. So that also, I guess, varies on the context, correct? Well, that, that, that comes back to the question, how, how, how is the agenda set for NITAG? And well, ideally it shouldn't be the industry saying, Oh, I have a great product. Uh, um, but we'll have an example actually where we'll discuss this in, in more depth. Um, I mean, I think you've covered already a lot. Um, so I think in the, uh, in the background material, there's, um, you can find more on that. And basically, um, um, I, I think you have covered all the, the main uh, buckets of uh, of information. So the epi information, obviously, around the, the disease, uh, the disease burden, et cetera. Um, the clinical characteristics you've not mentioned. Um, well, you've mentioned a little bit the outbreaks, and but I mean, disease, um, severity, um, et cetera. Uh, long-term complication and everything around the vaccine themselves, uh, uh, efficacy, effectiveness, safety, you've mentioned, uh, around logistics, um, schedules, target population, all that has been mentioned, uh, economic considerations. And yes, um, it usually, I mean, more and more NITACs are looking in, into that, and especially in countries uh where they pay uh, the full price of it, uh, where Gavi is not supporting, and where um, the um, um, the considerations uh, usually it's it it comes. Um, I mean, it's it's a trade off. If if you introduce something, uh, you might uh, you might need um, you can't use the, the money twice at least. Um, and then there are these um, other elements that you've started to mention on, on acceptability, social aspects, uh, ethical aspects, um, um, equity, uh, which uh, normally NITACs uh, should be looking into as well, because uh, this is very much uh, then also related to the, um, to the uptake, uh, the final uptake and your, your coverage. Can I ask regarding the uh, economic evaluations, like, is there a, something that WHO guidance says, like, you do need to look at it or you don't need to look at it. Because just to, like, in Belgium, the NITAC actually should not look at cost effectiveness. And then there's a health technology assessment uh, who does it, and it's separate. But it's really hard for people to understand because then there is no, I mean, the, the final decision to implement or not is made uh, by the program managers. But then, obviously, firms <laughs> use the NITAC advice to target the uh, individual doctors to say like, yeah, but this, this vaccine has been recommended by the NITAC. 
but it's like it's like Shingrix, it costs 170 euros per dose, and so it's actually found to be not cost effective at all at that dose. And then it comes down to the individual doctors, and it's I mean I find I'm finding it's really hard that it's separate. So for me it's it's suboptimal, but I don't know if there's any guidance on it or a uh, view of WHO because as you said you can only spend a dollar once layer. So I'm not sure that there is a firm WHO guidance on it. WHO would certainly say this is a, a, a huge question that you cannot, I mean, this is part of what you need to consider, but how you do it. And because if you want to have that, you need to have the capacities within the, the committee to, I mean, not necessarily to do those studies, but also to understand those. And um Sometimes uh, the history of the country makes that you have an agency that, that is more used to that. But um, the connect between the NITAG and that agency is not necessarily then, um, then perfect either. I, I don't think there is a one size fits all, but Kamel, you. No, maybe. I, I mean, it's true that, as Christoph said, I mean, there is a history in the country. In many countries, they have health technology assessment agencies, HE agencies. And those agencies have been in the past involved in deciding, do you need five MRI per city, per X number of population? So when, when the, the decision started to be, to know if you include or not a vaccine because of the cost effectiveness, those agencies took over because that was their job. The night act for a long time in many countries, they didn't have the expertise in health economics. Zero. Most of the countries have limited number of health economists. It's getting better now. And uh, so now you have now more and more night tags that are considering those questions because they have the capacity to do it. But then, of course, depending on the country, if the Ministry of Health has to get an official recommendation by the Health Technology Assessment Agency, they will ask the Health Technology Assessment Agency to do recommendation because that's that's how it was established. But what we recommend is to make sure that you have this connection between the health technology assessment agencies and the NITAC. What was recommended is that you need to have a representative from the HTA in the NITAC and the NITAC attending the discussion of the HTA when it comes to vaccine to make sure that the information is the same. Because, you know, modeling in health economics, you, you have the modeling that is provided by the pharmaceutical, you have the ones provided by the academics, you have the ones provided sometimes by WHO. I mean, all those are different, and you need somebody to be able to, uh, to do. So that's why it's important to have this discussion. But let's remember that at the end, the Ministry of Health is deciding. I mean, based on recommendation from NITAG and from the HTA, they are the one making the decision, not the NITAG, not the health technology assessment. And, and let's remember also that it's a recommendation on a public health perspective. A vaccine may be authorized, but the NITAG will say, we don't recommend it as a, as a public health program because we don't see it cost effective on the population side. But you may, as a patient, if you have the money and if your doctor prescribes you, then you may as an individual on the individual point of view, decide to, to get the vaccine. So we have to really separate the public health perspective and the individual perspective. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, but can you give some examples for some countries? Because in Brazil, we also have the Health Technology Assessment Agency and the NITAG. And I'm not sure if they're working together. And some of the work, I think, is the same, doing the systematic review, and then they can use this information from different point of view. So it, it shouldn't be the same work. I mean, health technology assessment is not the work that the NITAC should do. NITAC is going to review all the things you just said. Health technology assessment usually looks at the, the health benefits and the cost. And they really do that, those assessments. And they usually rank the intervention also. So governments make a decision on knowing which one is the most cost effective for one dollar invested. But you, they, they shouldn't have the same role. I know, so, uh, but I would like to know if you have some uh, good, good, good examples. Examples. Okay. How do you do? For example, you said that one. I don't know which country they have one person from the health center assessment. So I get the point. Going... I cannot respond to you now. I don't know. Uh, there is a, Christoph will probably at one point talk about this network of uh, night tags, the GNN. Philip mentioned that. There are some articles published on these models. Uh, you have colleagues here that are from countries where you have both. 
So, uh, but uh, I don't have an answer for you now. Maybe I don't know if I understood that question, but for example, in with rotavirus PCV in Guinea, it is not in the national immunization program. But at private level, if you want to uh, give it to your child, you can buy it from pharmacy and then. Yeah. Okay. Yes, please. Help, helpful to clarify or indeed really discuss what actually what the rules are, the different rules are, right? They, the NRA license the vaccine. That actually, I guess, should be sufficient for the vaccine to be used, and you can should go able to buy it. And the NITEC, what does the NITEC do? The NITEC recommends a schedule, and so I guess we need to somehow maybe clarify in most countries what's the role of that, because in the ACIP, for example, there are insurance coverage associated with the ACIP rule, right? And then versus what is what is you know, the ultimate outcome of the HTA, for example, is it going into an NIP, you know, or um, some kind of covered public program, right? So, I mean, I, you know, I don't know. Um, so that might be, you know, maybe good to clarify. So, I mean, as Kamal said, usually um, the NITAG um, makes a recommendation for the, for the public health level. And usually it goes in, I mean, it goes into the um, then into implementation, and usually it's it's then paid for by by uh, by the government. But again, there, there are I think big differences between night tags. But I think that's more or less the 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 model um, certainly that is uh, used by by um, Gavi eligible countries, um, of course, but also um, many of the low and middle income countries and and also actually by by um, by many high income countries if it's in the official uh schedule uh, usually the 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 government pays uh, pays for it but that doesn't that doesn't mean that there are not other vaccines that are licensed which are which are not in that situation just follow up on that because this is uh, in our group work i think this was a little bit of our confusion so two days ago we had group works where we pretended to be a night tech for germany and we were we were discussing whether to introduce shingles and i think our challenge was that we had no counterfactual you know we needed just to look whether the vaccine will have public health impact then we had calculated some figures how much would it cost to introduce it but then we're like so what so what do we do with this data now like we have no feedback information whether is this an acceptable amount or can we just say okay this is how many lives will be safe so on that basis we recommend that vaccine for introduction. You know, we had a little bit of a difficulty because we had nothing to compare that to and no constraints under which we need to operate. So, yeah, I found that a little bit more So, Matthias, it was an exercise. And it was like an hour, okay? Night tags, usually when they make a recommendation, I'm not talking about COVID because COVID was an exception. Usually it takes six months, eight months for an ITAC to make a recommendation because you have to dig into all those data that you mentioned. You have to discuss all that. Then in many countries, when there is a, when the health economics aspects are considered by NITAC, most of the time there is no threshold. There is no threshold. Only a few countries have threshold, like UK, like Netherlands, like, uh, I think maybe Australia. I'm not sure, but some countries have a threshold. Most of them, they don't. They present the data to the authority. The main recommendation will be on, should we introduce this vaccine? What dose? What is the preferred vaccine? and uh, which target population, all those things. There will be some mention on the cost effectiveness, but not on the price. On uh, They will not. They will let that to the authority to decide. And uh, I even have example of, of countries where, uh, you know, many vaccines are the price that they are uh, available at in middle-income or high-income countries. They are not cost effective. Many. But they are included in the schedule, and then the government decides to pay. To pay. So, that's why I think we have to be careful with the health economics question. Uh, in countries where there is a health technology assessment agency, which is a limited number of countries, then they have a role to play. But in most of the countries, there is no HTA, and the discussion is really between uh, the – it's not between. It's a discussion within the Minister of Health and with the manufacturer because there is this ongoing discussion. And the U.S. model is very unique. I would say it's really a well-advanced model because you have those different levels that are very clear and there's these mechanisms that when ACIP make a recommendation, then the private health insurance, they include it, but then there's this discussion regarding the national immunization program for the child that are covered by government 
vaccines are free for them, then there is another discussion. So it's a bit more, it's a bit complex uh, situation in the US. Maybe it's the right time to introduce the NITAG uh, framework, because then they will have uh, the whole picture of how the uh, making decision process is made. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a workshop. We cannot go into all the, again, um, so that you have some background material and, um, I think we, we will capture some of it. I, the thing that before moving to the next exercise, we have not talked about when, when we, when we look at the evidence around the vaccine itself, usually, uh, what, um, what, what we would like, uh, NITACs to do is to look at the quality of it. And that's where the, this whole, um, methodology about grading of evidence comes in. And that's where the, the, the evidence to recommendation framework also comes in. And, and that is basically, um, to have a little bit more, um, objective, um, um, measurement of, um, uh, of these, uh, these indicators. And, um, um, so obviously all night tags do not have the capacities to, to do the, the, the whole spectrum of, I mean, because, uh, eventually you can do a lot. You, you've, you've described what, what can be measured for disease burden, et cetera. But I mean, time is limited. Resources are limited. And, and certainly from WHO side, we encourage the, the countries to use as much as possible what is out there and, in terms of systematic uh, um, reviews, there's there's a wealth of information that is out there, and and especially um, uh, now through the the, um, the the GNN, the Global NITAG Network, and and the the resource center that goes with it, um, where there is um, also the um, the the German um, the German NITAG has actually set up a repository for systematic reviews. Where, where those are, are, um, are rated, uh, which are very useful. So there is, I mean, the bottom line is also make the best use out of, out of your little resources. Usually, um, NITAG members are very busy people and, and, and the secretariat has usually another hat also, um, doing, uh, the program, um, and, uh, and, uh, doing the secretariat for NITAG at, at nighttime. So I think, um, it's, it's making sure that, uh, um, it, at least you try to find evidence of comparable countries uh, so that you can uh, move. And then obviously, ideally, the country needs to, to get some clear markers uh, from as close as possible to their target populations. But, um, but yeah, making use of the existing information. I think we should move, um, Kamal, to the next one. So, so keep in mind it's it's one hour, 30 minutes. Huh? We're not going to make you a uh, night tax secretary in uh, one hour, 30 minutes. Okay. I worked almost five years on those night. It takes a lot of time to sort it out. All the things you're saying, because every country has its own specificity. So keep in mind that even if there are recommendations from WHO on what is a night tag, what it should be, Philippe presented that a few days ago. There are guidelines from WHO. There are documents. All that needs to be adapted to each country's specificity because not all the countries have the same context. So please be careful on that. There is no clear response. Only one thing that because Alejandro mentioned something, just to make it clear, national regulatory agency, FDA, EMEA, whatever it's called in your country, they review the clinical data, safety, efficacy, okay? We are not talking about that now. We are talking about the policy, the public health. They make, and Philip mentioned, sometimes night says we make a recommendation that is, that is not in the label that was uh, validated by the National Regulatory Agency. So let's be careful. So, okay, scenario B. Professor Watson, a new NITAC member, is the PI of an HPV vaccine trial. The NITAC will consider stating a preference for one of the two currently licensed HPV vaccines. It probably sounds very... Sounds yeah, familiar to many of you. The NITAC chair asked Professor Watson to recuse himself from the HPV vaccine session. Out. Professor Watson is upset. <laughs> of course he's upset. And states that he receives no personal benefit from the trial and should be allowed to participate 
as he knows HPV vaccine is better than any other member on the group, which is true. He probably knows much better than anybody else. So, what do you think? I want to hear from everybody because some are sleeping here. I guess. <laughs> okay. Let's start first row. Victoria. Um, well, now at that point, I hope that there is um, a SOP or a guideline for that kind of night tech so that not, uh, it's not like an individual decision. Okay. So you would refer to what is in the SOPs? Yes. And okay. if we didn't have an SOP for that, then I suggest that we better have, have one. Okay. <laughs> Good. One point. Who's... Yeah, let's go to the whole row. I want to hear from everybody. Yeah, yeah so I was just going to mention that if he's the PI on a vaccine trial, that, that vaccine trial would have already been reviewed by the regulatory authority, and I assume that vaccine would have be one that's under consideration, right? So I don't know if it, it's that big of a deal. So you don't see any conflict of interest here? Already validated by the NRA? Okay, next. Yeah, I have the same uh, opinion. I think he uh, should participate, but maybe... He should be out the decision making about uh, the validation of the recommendation to implement. Uh, so he's system. part of the discussion, but he doesn't make a decision at the end. Do you put him out of the room when you make the decision? Out? No. Yeah. You're not an out guy. Like you don't like put. No. Okay. Let's continue. Yeah, I I agree that he should be part of the discussion and be able to share information on the the HPV vaccine, generally speaking, but the decision. Okay, be. let's continue. Let's see. Three. Okay. First, I mean, we will sit with Professor Watson and say that we understand his concern, the dissatisfaction. <laughs> Diplomacy. Oh, that's nice. Okay, we like that. Then, depending upon the country's situation, what the NITAC decides, like in some country, like it might be okay to come uh, for him to come and present and not be part of the vo voting or decision making. In some countries, it might not be allowed that the researcher might not be allowed to come and present themselves. So we, in that situation, we can tell them that we will look at the results of your report. Uh, uh, yeah, but let me stop you, Shui. He's a, he's a member already of the NITAC. He's not just a researcher coming. Okay, he's right. a member. So in that, if he is not allowed in countries where he is not allowed to come and present himself, then we can say that we can look at the results of your study. And if there is any questions, we will get back to you. Okay. And if you think that there's no, you are the most expert, the other people lack the expertise, then... If the uh, NITAC thinks that there might be other expertise needed, we may uh, invite some other experts. I'm, I'm going to make it more complicated. This is a small country. There's only one person who knows about this. He's the professor. He, okay, he treated the mother of the president. <laughs> if, if there is concern, we can come back to you to ask some questions. So, so okay. okay. Uh, from, from, in my opinion, uh, as he is expert in HPV, like he knows everything about the HPV, but he is also like some some sort of conflict of interest. Some sort of. No, conflict of interest <laughs> will be there. He he can be allowed to give all the epidemiological data about HPV and everything. And also like uh, he can also give his opinion about the uh, vaccines, only the safe, not exactly safety, only only the like uh, uh, efficacy and uh, whatever data he has of both the vaccines exactly without showing any kind of. Uh, okay. like, uh, so let's continue. I'm going to ask two other questions. So the, con the potential conflict of interest is that he was managing the clinical trial of one of the vaccine. Okay. But he said, I'm not receiving any money, any personal benefit, any personal benefit. So I want you to think about what it means, uh, no personal benefits. So I'll continue on the back and then I'll come back. Anybody there? Yeah, please go ahead. I think this situation we have uh, experienced by our NITEX during the we have introduction of the PCV vaccine. One of the core member, he's the do he's a, uh, a trial for the PCV pneumocyte to encourage in the country. So that time we, we still use him because we only have uh, him and that country. So the data we have is our, our current situation country. So data we still use him as the, this data and we, after we make some analysis comparison with another product. So we still use him, he still is inside the, 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 the teams for the Was he part of the final decision? As we know, the devotion of method now only for one, two people. It's, there is seven people. So the vote is for more than four people agree, we pass. If three left, 
not pass. Yeah, but don't you think he's going to influence people? Okay, I'm, I am a pediatrician. I have, I don't, I know nothing about HPV. I treat babies. The guys, I know him. We went to school together, to medical school together. I, I, I trust him. It's like Christophe. We went to medical school together. I trust him. I know nothing. The guy said, yes, we need to introduce this one. Maybe he's biased, but I, I, I trust him. So he, even if it's four to seven or uh, seven participants, uh, he, he's already influencing the, the, the vote by asserting things. Uh, because uh, we know that in the members, we came from separate uh, areas, so we, uh, we not, uh, know each other. And also, there is a conflict interest form we need to form uh, yeah. before. Okay. Yeah. So I think that the personal benefit, going back to your question, for me, this means that it uh, doesn't have any uh, income in case uh, the vaccine is uh, basically distributed. So this makes him more neutral. And so I tend to agree to add him. Maybe Let not me uh, challenge you. But I have a Let question. me challenge you. Wait, wait. I challenge you on that. Yeah. He said it's a person. He yeah. has no personal benefit. How do you know it's no, true? No, that is true. But I, I, I wanted to, to say another little thing. For me, anyway, content-wise, he is involved just in one of the two currently licensed. So even if we have him in the discussion for the content, we should have another expert involved in the other vaccine to balance. Oh, so that. Even you, you, you bring two experts. But yes, because, you know, this person, even in without bias, with the best intention, will know everything about one of them, but nothing about the other. Yeah, but let me tell you, in your small country, you probably don't have two experts who have done two clinical trials of two different vaccines in the same population. Yeah, but can you... Can you find then another expert, you know, from, okay. a, from a different... So you look for experts, okay. Yeah. You okay, let's continue. Yeah. Okay, wait, Gonzalo, please go ahead. Yeah, so I think it's really important. This is why we have, like, documented conflict of interest. So we need the documented conflict of interest from everyone on the, the committee. And also, like, ethically, we're going to hope that the other NITAG members are going to ethically do the right thing and not necessarily listen to, to him or her. So I really think that the person should contribute to the conversation. They're the expert. We don't have other experts within within the group, but should not be a voting member. Okay. Now, I was thinking in, in, in this NITAG network, maybe you can use it to, to ask another NITAG, another country, or maybe from another region, to maybe share some experience about that or, or some maybe other doctor or other Watson uh, to help with that. And maybe he should be no. not in, in, the, in the NITAG for this vaccine. But then, I mean, the problem is that your minister will say, who is those? You bring guys from other countries to tell us what we have to do? <laughs> like you're bringing people from our enemy country, most of the time, the neighboring country. You bring people from Uruguay to tell us what we're going to do. Yes, I mean, I think I'm, I'm doing what I want. <laughs> <laughs> and then decide. Yeah, then... I think there shouldn't be an automatic um, assumption that just because he worked on the trial that, you know, this is a bad person, he's going to advocate for his own own vaccine. I think that's important. I think it's important to, the whole reason we have NITEX is because we recognize that um, locally generated um, evidence and, and, and guidelines are, are important. So I think that's important to take into account. And I think he should participate. I think he should declare his interest, but I think he shouldn't get to vote. Also, there are ways to evaluate how NITEX are working. So you can also, at a later stage, validate whatever ultimate guidelines were generated uh, from this particular sort of exercise. So let me write two things. I heard earlier, I think, Fazan, I think you said opinion. First, I want opinion to be banned. My tag is not about opinion, even if I just what you meant. It was not that way. But I just want to make sure that this is not opinion. We are not asking opinion. We are asking people to talk about the data. What is in the data? So that's one. Trust. I, I love trust. I love to trust people until I'm deceived. I'm like, oh. The problem is not that much what the NITAG will think about this colleague that they know well and they work with and they trust him. What is the population going to think? Because if they discover that you are, let's say that HPV sometimes has been controversial, you want to, you introduce the vaccine, you recommend the introduction of vaccine, and then a journalist say, oh, the guy who, who was part of the discussion was paid by the manufacturer. 
And they're not going to say personal payment or clinical trial. They're going to say the guy is paid by the industry. So the NITAC, we cannot trust those people. They are paid by the industry. So that's where the trust is on. A few, and then we move on. Amel, sorry. Sorry. For the, <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. We have a big question on the kid online. So then what's the role, if there is an important uh, information that you need from the manufacturer, how do you manage it? There will be a question after on the manufacturer, Chris. We'll have a case on how to manage the relation with manufacturer. I think a lot of um, data interpretation is how the data is framed. And I think um, having a principal investigator in a clinical trial present data is going to be very biased unless... But even then, I don't see, think a principal investigator is going to bash his or her trial. So I think, um, I mean, I think the it should be assumed that whatever is presented could be very biased, and I think definitely not a voting member. I just think it's very problematic. And personal gain and benefit, you know, for a researcher, a lot of it is reputation and how far your research goes and to have – an HPV vaccine rolled out in, in a country that you were a PI on. I think that's all so problematic for this NITAC. Noted. Meru, last comment. Yeah, I, I, for me, again, it's a declaration of interest, no voting. But also, I guess the whole point of a NITAC and having a group of experts, even if it's a small group, is that everyone should be able to understand and comprehend the data and the data should be transparent and understand the evidence. So it doesn't matter if you're not an HPV expert as an individual, you should have that much ability to understand the evidence and the whole use of grade, et cetera, is to kind of go through that. So the whole committee should be able to vote, even if that pers one person isn't being able to, to talk about that topic. So thanks, Mewan. We're going to stop because we have to move on. But I would like to say that Mewan made a very good point. There are processes that you have to respect in an ITI. They are the review of the literature. They are grading of the quality of the information that is uh, provided. You have the way you're going to present the data during the discussion that even if you're not a specialist of HPV, you should be able as a specialist to understand what we're talking about and, and have all the information to make a decision. Going back to this case, you see there is some diversity of opinions. That's why it's critical that this is managed in the SOPs from the beginning. Because you don't want to do it on the case base. Like, oh, this time we have this and this time we have another. It has to be in the SOPs. And most of the time what would happen, because countries have limited expertise, is what most of you said. You would invite the person first. You have to inform everybody about the, the potential conflict of interest. So you will need to have more information on what he says. Oh, personal, what does it mean? So you need to have more information on that on a written basis. And then you will publicize that because NITAC have to make public the, the potential conflict of interest. And then the discussion, you can allow the person to take part of the discussion, but you have to be very careful as the chair to make sure that this is not opinion or is not influencing. Facts, only facts. And then most of the NITACs will not allow the person to even be in the room when the, the final decision will be made. And all that will be written in the minutes of the, of the meeting. So it's, it's all about transparency and trust. You want the public to trust your recommendation because you respected all those rules. And if somebody comes saying, oh, the guy works for the industry, yes, it was published on the website. We managed it during the discussion. He didn't take part of the, to the vote. And so it's very important to make all that. Well, I was a bit long. Sorry, Krista. Okay. So. Technovac, a vaccine manufacturing company, contacts the NITAC chair. The company states that they have important yet unpublished data that they may that may lead to a change on the recommendation on the use of the Pickett vaccine. The company requests that the committee reconsider its recommendation for use of the vaccine at its next meeting. They state that they will come and present their new data for the committee. Um, how do you like that? Shall we go again through the room the other way around? I, th I think, at least for ACIP, for example, um, we, we you can go to you, you have meetings, for example, where you can go to show preliminary data 
still unpublished and clearly then reconvene. So you can have those um, exchanges. So I think that from that perspective, just reading it quickly, this can be that clearly having then review the whole thing, but you can have like some touch bases and, and while you're accumulating the data, you can share, yeah. I think. Is it with ACIP or with the working group or? The, maybe the work, work, working group actually, yeah. Um. So I have a lot of issues with, with this. Um, so first I think that there has to be some like standard operational procedure to say, this is how we will accept, you know, um, different topics on our um, agenda. Um, also, the company cannot request when they're going to be on, on the agenda and say when they are going to, to come. So I think that the key with this is having kind of documented processes. And I think uh, uh, I agree with her, but the uh, only thing, uh, if the chair wants to consider the chair sh may, like should uh, consult all the members, take the permission of everyone, and then uh, allow the company to present the new data. Okay. But imagine you have six companies on different antigens uh, who have the best new data, totally unpublished, that they want to present now. Um, my biggest issue with this is the uh, reconsidering the recommendation based on unpublished data. So I'm fine for unpublished data to come in as like a, this is what we're doing right now, start to talk about it. But I don't think anyone should be potentially making changes in their recommendation before peer review. That seems like a problematic issue for an IT This is what we did in COVID all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Just put it out there. Okay, COVID was a pandemic situation. Lots of things happened during COVID that would not have been normal NITIDE procedures. Not the gold standard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, in, in the ACIP is not a rule that the, uh, the data are published. But in the um, UK it is. So, like, the okay. ACIP isn't the only night tag. Right, okay. Like, <laughs> making decisions here. In the UK, they do require data I mean, to be published. Why is it unpublished in the first place? It's very right. new. Very new, but, but it also, it, I mean, yeah, but, it also takes a time. Like, it takes a lot of time to publish data. Um, you know, um, especially within a company, it's probably more lengthy. But the peer review um, process is a valuable process. I think it's not about publication; it's about peer review. And you can, you know, you can put up and cut your data any way you want. But the peer review process is a really important one, especially in trial settings, to make sure that there's not, you know disproportionately positive presentation of data in a paper. And so, yeah, yeah I, I believe in the peer review yeah. process. But Sorry. for example, so just briefly, I mean, the data are usually also published on clinicaltrial.gov and the EU clinical trial registry. So the data have to come out at some point, whether they're published in a peer review journal or not, they're public. But, but the results are public. Are public. So, um, yes, please. Sorry. Okay. Um, beyond COVID, I wanted to add. And no. Oh, sorry. Okay. So, the lady in red, the gentleman in white, the gentleman in brown, and the lady in blue. Thank you. Uh, so I think ITAC check can uh, actually tell the company that you publish the data and six other companies as well. They can also publish the data and then our experts would, and tax expert would sit and talk about it and see the global uh, burden and other data and the NTAC chair would get back to the company. This would be the response. Okay. I don't know if NITAC's in their SOPs have like special terms to review the recommendations. So if they have some term to review, maybe this recommendation, they could ask all the new data and they should be published, I think. Yes. And, and use it to make the next recommendation about this. I don't know what it is. Uh, ah, vaccine. Okay. So something about the agenda setting when, um, when recommendations are being reviewed, uh, 
at a period periodic um, pace. Um, I didn't forget. So, um, I mean, I would definitely um, support what others have said. Uh, I don't have any issue with um, the unpublished data, but when he says that he would like the chair or the committee to change the decision, uh, that's uh, where it comes from. But beyond that, my question was going to be probably for uh, Dr. Kamil. Isn't it that way in reality? Is, is, isn't it that way done in resource-constrained countries when vaccines are already approved or licensed by I mean, WHO, because we, we literally don't have like the, the capacity to go through all these uh, steps. One is approved by WHO. Like right now, we're going to introduce um, um, rotavirus very soon and PCV. But <laughs> so, have you ever come across such issues, Dr. Kamel? You've been personally, oh, sorry. Just, I say that, uh, 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 if we're talking about vaccine that has been, that has been, uh, authorized by WHO pre-qualification, because for example, you don't have a reg regulatory agency in your country. You're not going to review the application. And most of the time, the manufacturer will not even apply. In some, in many countries, for the regulatory, because the market is small, they are not interested, or it's a GAVI eligible country. Yeah. Then PQ pre qualification of WHO applies, but most of the countries will accept vaccines from PQ, or they will if they support if they get support from GAVI, they will get vaccines that are PQ. Okay, yeah. so then the NITAC decision is mostly on how which vaccine you're going to do. Uh, same like same than any NITAC. Most of the time, the industry will not come to you with data. They won't. They already got the authorization in the countries where they're interested. And the pre-qualification is a long process also. But then it comes to you to look at what data you have. Again, you have many sources. We talked about WHO recommendations, SAGE recommendations, WHO position papers, the ones that we, we probably uh, looked at in the past few days. Those are a good source of information. The data, most of the time, if you don't have data, you look for data in the neighboring countries if you need data. You try to do some analysis, but it's very rare that you have specifically an industry coming for that. I, I, I think the decision of the NITAC there is not the approval process, but actually how that fits in with the other vaccines that you already have in your system. How are you going to use it? And that would be the recommendation to the EPI or the Ministry of Health or where it's going to do the implementation of how the vaccine fits in with the other programs. I think that would be a wonderful role for this advisory group to do. And one thing about the composition of the NITEX, that should be also clear from the beginning. And that can include in many countries, foreign people. I mean, people who are born outside. The next question. No. <laughs> oh, I, I, I was just going to make, a, it's more of a question, follow up on that agenda setting. Like, I'm, I'm curious of how often would, I would assume that there is a regular process or a horizon scanning approach that you would give you a vaccine process every few months or six years to kind of think, and then you kind of allow the companies to engage in that way rather than we have new data, review your policy. Yeah. Question, comment, I don't know. Yeah. Not to that, not to that question, but I have to the point. Uh, I just want to touch on the peer review again. You said that, you know, the NITAC members, they'll receive, um, they'll look at the data and they'll grade the quality of the data and, and assess the level of, of confidence that they have in the data that is being presented. So is that in itself not used as a replacement for a peer review process? Could, could that be used as a sort of a really valid and in-depth um, look through the data? So that's, I see you saying no. And then the second question that I have is, you know, if I were an ITAC member, I would just want to really understand a little bit more the context, you know, why they're coming to us, what, whether they have, they have sent the data to WHO PQ, to some national regulatory authorities, and what is the particular questions that they have for us? So I think just to, to, to build on that, I think it's really important that, again, coming back to these SOPs where you decide upfront how you're going to handle that, because this will, this happens. I mean, it's not, 
So you'd better plan for it. And what you don't want is that the company reaches out to individuals and, and start to, um, so it needs to be clear how you want to handle it, whether it's uh, regular touch points in, if there's a, a working group uh, dedicated for, for that disease, whether it comes to the whole committee, but then um, how do you handle that? It depends also on the volume of, of the, the the requests you get from companies, but you need to to document how you want to do it, and it needs to be transparent and uh, explainable to uh, to the public because again it comes also to the back to the perception. Um, so it's not about um, excluding the industry from 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 providing adding elements to the decision making process, but it's to to get each one at uh, the right place and then on the um on the um the regular update of um of the the policy yes i think that's ideally that uh, a nitec should should be looking at what it has produced and whether um it feels that things outdate and i mean uh, i can talk from from the sage perspective we're doing it but again that needs resources that you need someone to monitor quite actively um, the literature and um, but ideally uh, you would do that so that you wouldn't be caught by surprise by such uh, such things popping up because usually they don't come out of nowhere those information um, yeah Santosh I just had a comment on the last blurb. Is it normal for the manufacturers to come and present at the night tag right like I think in my understanding it's more Secretary who does all of that, right? And they're not even present in the meeting. So is that is uh, any any NITAG experience here? <laughs> give the I want to give the floor to uh, a NITAG rep. Yeah, then please one, two, three. Yes. I think I also have the, the same experience like uh, this one before since as a night tech. Uh, during the sometimes uh, we have a, a communication directly for the company to ask to show us about uh, the product and uh, even the price. So at that time I would just answer that thank you very much for your your communication. We will follow to our regulation and look at the kind of situation that we need the the, the vaccine or not. But at that time we still have enough that one kind of vaccine. So. The country perspective we not need, so we just think back again to the company. So everything going well. Uh, other things I just want to inform that I think maybe in here some first no no NITEC uh, doing our job is is free of charge. We not gain anything by the by the government. What recommendation we do is independent, independently based of in evidence. So we not gain anything from payment by the, any government or any company. Thank you. Yes, well, maybe just the example from Germany. So we, I just turn around, sorry. <laughs> um, so we, um, uh, we have this, this regular meetings, but it's not with the NITEC members. So we don't want any impression of the NITEC members, um, well, have too much contact to the company. So they come to the secretariat and even more people from our immunization unit so that there's a, a lot more people there. And then we will summarize what they presented, and it's mostly unpublished data because this is what we are interested in, and then present that to the NITEC okay. members. So it's like um, not the direct content. Okay. And do you have at times NITEC members that say, listen, I've been contacted by company XYZ? And, um... Yeah, and I know that the secretariat will tell them, well, better not to, better tell them to, to come to us. And this is also the case for, for us. So we don't want them to contact us personally, but it goes through the secretariat, like the one email address that there is there. So... I guess it also depends on, on the resources you have, et cetera. Just to say that in Belgium, uh, we recently had a hearing uh, about uh, RSV. So it's not a NITEC um, meeting, but the working group, um, basically every, uh, all the NITEC members that are interested, they did have a meeting with the company where the company could present the data on NIRSEVIMAP. And then it was an occasion to also challenge the company maybe <laughs> and ask critical questions, et cetera. And I found it very helpful because it does allow us to already kind of pick up some speed before 
uh, everything is out there and we could kind of ask them also about what they thought would the price be and obviously they didn't answer it but <laughs> and would you i mean uh, if for a given product where there's several manufacturers would you then reach out to the others to say listen um we've been contacted and we propose uh, manufacturer X to present. If you have new data, you could also, or is it as? So I'm not secretariat. Um, I don't think they would. I think ideally they would. In this case, I mean, we have the data on uh, palipizumab already. We don't have, I mean, nilcipimab is a new one. So it was about a new one. And we did say that we also want to have the info on the on the vaccines um, and probably will not make a recommendation before we, we have the entire picture. So if you are, oh, sorry, it's okay. You can, I was also going to ask a question. No, you go, finish. Very quick. So if you're NITAG and there are three companies that are getting with the same similar product, one is first, the other ones are a bit later. Do you wait? And the first one is probably going to be unsatisfied, but you wait to get to listen to and review the data as much as you can. Is that the rule? Or would you, for example, say, no, the second company is, is generate, is going to generate the data in six months. I'm not going to wait to see that. How does that work? So what is I, the best practice? I don't know what, so what do you think? No. You know, um... I can tell you at Sage, I mean, at times uh, w w when we think uh, things are bundled in a relatively limited time frame, we would try to handle that together. And if you know, then we would uh, maybe uh, decide to, to start a working group a, a bit later because we know we would get the data for a more complete data set also for other products. Uh, but I don't know if there are other experiences. I think it's better, but then it depends also on the urgency of, of getting something out. I can just sort of confirm that from the industry side, that if you know your product is coming out close to other ones, the assumption is that the review will be together and that night tags will often want to recommend more than one product just for diversity of products in the market. But if you have a substantial enough head start, you may get into the market on your own. So that like difference in head start and, and is a is a big discussion point internally for pharma. Jumping on one of your comments, um, recommendation for products. I mean, NITACs might not want to go that. That I mean, for Sage, clearly we want as much as possible to to stay at a at an antigen level whenever possible, rather than than making recommendation for products. But uh, obviously, I mean. COVID has been a very special period where all the rules have been a little bit turned around. But um, um, I don't know if there are night tags who specifically make, but sometimes there's only one product, one, one manufacturer for, for, for a given antigen also. Um, I, antigen I, and platform, no? Like sometimes you have a significant difference between the platforms, then you would... Yeah. Yeah. Or li like you, or life attenuated, which you can't use in all the target groups, etc. That you would specify, and then even though you don't like name the brand name, <laughs> it's kind of obvious. Although I mean, industry likes to play the uh, the little differences also in order not to be in the same pot. Um, that's where the night time needs to yeah. strike a balance. Yeah. I I just had a hypothetical question, and it's unlikely to happen. But what if it was a public sector funded? manufacturer it's unlikely to happen but i guess yeah but so would that same level of conflict exist technically it should be but i'm just curious about yeah manufacturer. yeah manufacturer. i mean uh let's take indonesia biopharma is owned by government mostly uh it's denmark uh, had the manufacturer and uh, but it's a manufacturer i mean you're you have to be it, to have the same approach for any manufacturer. I think we will move on unless uh, last burning question. And just uh, like uh, saying, like with my friend Ian mentioned that from LMIC country, normally we we not have decision to we only look at the pre qualified vaccine by the by the WHO. Mm -hmm. uh, as uh, as my country, we uh, we previously we as uh, a member of country Gavi, but. Already post position. So all of the recruitment do the after first year will be by Gavi, but for the second years, upstairs, 
all of it covered by the government. So uh, what we do is still have, we're using the procured by the uh, UNICEF, where, which one the price is different uh, with uh, when we just procure, procure directly to the company. Thank you. So minimum. I mean, this is the last step for uh, uh, rolling out any vaccine. I mean, for example, we are in the middle of HPV launch. So uh, everything would be, uh, everything has already been worked out. And at the end, uh, the country is seeing which is the cheapest uh, vaccine, which is a cost benefit analysis. And based on that, vaccine is chosen. So this is a bit hypothetical for me. Yeah, and it's, I would say that. In countries where you have big manufacturers, I'm talking about South countries, what we call the developing countries manufacturers, the CVMN. When they have manufacturers like Indonesia, India, China, uh, Brazil, and others, yeah, it's true that the NITAC has to be very careful in staying its, in its role in making a recommendation. But then most of the time, the government will take a decision regarding the choice of vaccine, taking into account other elements, not just the cost effectiveness or whatever, but also if it's a local manufacturer, it, they will most of the time privilege this manufacturer. And I would say it's fair because you also have seen during the COVID outbreak that uh, the countries that had the manufacturer were the one having a better coverage and, uh, and rapid access to the vaccine. So government is considering not just health, and, but also economical interest and all that. Okay, so let's move on because uh, otherwise when, uh, we're going to finish. So uh, the case is the Brundtland Pediatric Association refuses to follow the recommendation of the Minister of Health's NITAC. The association has written a letter to you as the executive secretariat of the NITAC stating that the committee is not credible and does not properly review evidence. It happens more frequently than you think. <laughs> so, what do you do? The secretary, you're the secretary. You're the uh, night tax secretary. Request meeting. <laughs> you don't respond. Go ahead, yeah, please. So I think this can happen. So in this situation, what we should do is like, first thing, NITAG is not the uh, committee to take decisions. It's the gov government or the ministry that takes the decision. NITAG yeah, but they say, recommends, wait, wait. Recommends it refuses to follow the recommendation. Right. So NITAG recommends only. Yeah. So okay. so we should sit with the, uh, this is pediatric association. So what are their concerns? And we can tell. I mean, we can tell them that on what basis this decision was taken. So maybe taken. Maybe then they will be able to understand, agree. So I so can. You, you establish. You're a diplomat, right? <laughs> this is the second time you want to discuss. You want to yeah. explain. No, this is what. Good for me. I like it. But... I like to share an experience because this was this happened in Nepal when there was a discussion between PCD 13 and PCD 10, yeah. and all the pediatricians were in favor of introducing PCD 13. But we introduced, P and Nepal introduced PCB 10. And at that time, pediatricians were not happy. But the, when they uh, later, like, they found out what was the reason for that decision. So the, the two reasons for that decision was, one, because of the logistic. It came into multi vial and single vial. So that was one thing. And another thing, like, that the country uh, seroservalence, so that the, uh, the, the serotypes that were circulating at that time were covered more by PCV 10. So based on that, they did not write a letter, but they were, they were very Went to TV, which is easier. <laughs> Just to go to TV and those but, bunch of people, they don't know what they talk about. I'm a pediatrician. After know. listening to the evidence, they were more or less, more or less convinced. Okay, so dialogue, discussion, right? Okay, so I think... Um, Maybe just to add on to what she's saying, obviously, remembering that NITEC recommends that it's not necessarily law. No. It depends on how your country is set up. Is it an expectation that every clinician should follow a Ministry of Health guidelines? Is it binding by law, etc.? And also what makes it easy is if you publish the, ev the evidence to recommendation framework and obviously the bios of the different people on the committee so they can see exactly what's, um, 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 what's going on. So you communicate around the, the recommendation 
and also if it's compulsory or not for clinicians. Okay, two points. I had first. Yeah. What uh, IDAG's chair is actually uh, Secretary Health for Ministry of Health. Say it again. What if secretary? Uh, what if NTAG's, uh, uh chair is uh, also secretary health minister? No. Of Most of the time, what is recommended is that the chair of the NITAG should be independent. He or she should be not a government employee, not like a, from the Ministry of Health. It can be a a professor of a university. It can be a a medical doctor in the hospital, even if those are public and owned by government, but it should not be somebody from the government or the Ministry of Health. It's the recommendation. Why? You're looking at me like that. Why? Because you don't want a, the guy receiving the recommendation to be the one making the recommendation. You want to keep it separate for two things. Just to ensure that there is no bias, no conflict of interest. I'm at the Ministry of Health. I don't want to pay for this Zoster vaccine because I don't have the money and that means I'm going to have to fight with the Ministry of Health to go to the Ministry of Finance. So I'm just going to say, oh, we don't recommend that one. So that's the first reason. The second reason is as the Ministry of Health, I can, I can put the blame, the, I can play the blame, the blame game of the NITAG. It's not me recommending that we do the Zoster vaccine. That's the NITAG. They reviewed the data and they said we should recommend it. That's not me. So we'll follow the recommendation or not, but that's, so that's why it has to be independent. Yeah. And then I move this side because I'm Yeah, yeah. So I think that in addition to, especially our diplomat as I suggested, it would be good to do an after action review within the NITAC to verify the communication strategy and the stakeholder management, because it could be that the data are there, but have not been uh, uh, promptly or communicated or communicated to the right people. And so as a, you know, a lesson learned, it could be good. So let me then continue on one thing that was not mentioned for you for that. Communicated to the right people. Can you ex elaborate? For instance, uh, uh, associations of uh, impacted uh, population, right? In this case, uh, pediatric associations. Or, you know, depending on the level of detail, even broader public, because you mentioned at the beginning, Kamel, about the transparency and the elements. So it can be a plan that includes different levels depending on the scope. So let me then go one step further. Who are the members of the NITAG? So we have some NITAGs here. Victoria, who are the members of the NITAG? But there should be, for example, be a pediatrician, yeah. and maybe he's yeah. not yeah. in the association, but that's not really... Probable, so one of the recommendations is usually to have an official, what we call ex officio, representative of the National Pediatric Association. Usually we have those officials, pediatric association, GPs, nurses, all those official bodies that exist in the country that are orders or scientific societies, they should be represented in the night tag. That's a way for you to communicate with them. So they know what's going on in the night tag, what is discussed. And that's a way of avoiding that. Because the guy cannot say that afterward when one of his members was in the night tag. We can turn to him. Oh, your, your delegate was there. Why he didn't say anything? So that's important to have those additional members. In some countries, WHO, UNICEF are invited as observers. It depends on the countries, but you need to have those uh, non-core members that are part of the NITAC. Let's follow Santosh. I just wanted to reiterate, I think in my experience, the Pediatric Association is always sometimes the chair or the member of the NITAC, right? So that's really mitigates this thing. But if a scenario where the Pediatric Association was not involved, it's always nice to kind of call for a meeting and then kind of justify it, as we did for PCV-10 versus PCV-13 provide the scientific reasons, the programmatic reasons, the operational reasons, and then I think... Uh, but I would say, I would advise you to go the other way. Be preventive. Make sure that they are in your committee. So you don't have to do the diplomacy afterward. You do it during the discussion. And just to say that the chair, the members of the committee, they are independent person. They don't represent any organization. Even if they are members of the Pediatric Association, of course they will be. But they are not there because they are the chair of the, of the Pediatric Society. It's, they are there as an individual 
recognized for its ex- for his expertise or her expertise, and are appointed most of the time by the Ministry of Health. Atush. So I agree with most of the things that have been said so far, and I think they're asking here for two things. So one, that the, the committee is not credible, and the second thing is that they haven't reviewed the evidence properly. So I would maybe go back to them and ask, you know, was it specifically about the committee that is not credible and about the process of reviewing the evidence? And if then if the considerations are really credible, you know, one could, I don't know, commission an independent review using the WHO guideline for assessment of NITACs if, if they are really, you know, critical um, issues that they have highlighted. So I hear you, and I think we have to do something, but also I, I liked also what uh, what one, uh, what colleague told is let's not overreact. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Because most saying of the time, critical. Yeah. Most of the time, those react. things are yeah. person things, yeah. personal things. Most of the time, they are, he's jealous because he's not in the night time. It happens so many times. I can tell you so many people are like, I'm not part of this group, I'm going to destroy whatever they're going to say. So I think um, there are also sometimes there are confusing role between NITAC and like um, pediatric society. Yeah. And uh, for example, in Thailand, pediatric society also like have their own recommendation of point of view about how to use vaccines. But sometimes it's not get along with the NITAC. But in terms of the clinician or people or community, they confuse which recommendation that they should follow and it's create conflict. So what, what is the role in other countries like in the US, but is AAP and ACAP should be, is it always get along or sometimes it's, it's very. No, there are. So if we can ask colleagues, but they are, we have to think about the pediatrician as, as clinicians uh-huh. doing individual, individual okay. relations. So I assess the need for this kid to get vaccinated, where, again, the NITAC is providing a policy recommendation, a public health perspective. Yeah. Like, these vaccines should be introduced to, to have this impact on the population. And most of the time, the NITAC recommendation will be followed by support from government. Mm-hmm. Like, the vaccine is free. The provision is free. And most of the time when it's free, if the, the pediatrician wants to have access to those free vaccines, they have to, to follow the, the, the policy that is recommended by government. But again, still, they are clinician. You do as a, you're a clinician. Mm-hmm, yeah. So you also have this relation with the yeah. patient where you may make a different, a, a decision that is different from that. But again, the recommendation is uh, public health. Uh, last two and we move on. So I... Again, you? Sorry. Joking. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I did some research and uh, I have a minute of meeting of one uh, in Taggy, India. So apparently the chair is Secretary of Health and Family Welfare, GOI. And uh, even the OM says, which is another paper, says that uh, uh, to constitute NTAG designated the secretary to the GOI to be its chair and deputy commissioner at its member secretary. So I gave you the recommendation for the best practice based based on what we observed in the countries. Because again, uh, when WHO started doing recommendation for NITAC, they didn't invent things. The first supplement we've done at that time was description of 20 NITACs, like how they work, who are members. And I can tell you the diversity, maybe not 20, it was 15, I think, but the diversity was huge. Like in some countries, it was government. In others, it was completely independent. In some, it was mostly the pediatric society. So it was, so based on the best practices, and we looked at the impact of the recommendations, we said the best approach would be to do A, B, and C, and D, and then it makes the, the recommendation strong. It makes the group independent, etc. So it changed from a country to another. Yeah, I, I India is a very particular country. I should not tell you that. You know that. Many of the recommendations of the ITAGI, the NITAGI, are then going to the court. People going to the court to challenge them. Yeah. It happens so many times. Yeah. So that's very specific. Last question. Yeah. I was wondering if you could tell me then what is the general consensus as to who has the legal authority, I guess, from the recommendation perspective. So if the NITAG made a recommendation and the Ministry of Health said, yes, this is what we want, and, you know, they put that out there, but can the pediatric association, can they refuse? And can their members then refuse to provide it if it's been deemed uh, so for the public, public I w- good? I would say that most of the case, in most of the cases, again, you have to make sure that the NITAG includes those uh, societies. You have to, because otherwise... 
problems can happen. When it's not the case, I've, in my experience, I've never seen so many cases where the pediatric society differed from the, from the NITAC recommendation. Most of the time, it was for the choice of vaccine. And most of the time, when, as you expressed in Nepal, by discussing and explaining, I mean, then people have a consensus. Uh, the last word is for the Minister of Health. Minister of Health is the one paying. If he said, I pay for this vaccine with this schedule recommended by NITAC, then the pediatrician have to do that if, they, if the vaccine is reimbursed or free. If they don't, they may have problems, but they, they can still do. They can still do it. And don't forget also that this is public. You also have the private market in many countries where people follow schedule. I've seen like in Lebanon, I, I saw like, Four different schedules used by the private market. French one, US one, UK one, Australia one. So depending on where the pediatrician was trained, the, he was using the, the schedule of the country where he was trained because he was like, oh, it's much better than the one we have here. And they pay and people pay. But that's just a part of the population. But in some countries, it can be up to 20% of the population in middle income and, and, and low income countries. Let me stop here and let's move. Miru, later. Sorry. Until uh, three forty. Ah, okay. Well, you have one minute. No, I was wrong. I checked. Is we are finishing at three forty, right? And we do the picture at three forty. And I, I, I didn't introduce uh, Alejandro here. So sorry, Alejandro. You may say a few. Alejandro was the chair of Sage. I mean, he's a great expert, but he's going to do a lecture tomorrow. But he was the chair of Sage, so that's why he's very knowledgeable about. Night time, sage, etc. So, the government of the Republic is being attacked in the media about the decision to introduce quadrivalent influenza vaccine in the elderly. The use of the vaccine was recommended by the country's night time. As a result, the, the chief house officer is requesting an external evaluation of the night time and its performance. Um, what are the important elements that should be assessed and how would you go about it? Yeah. yeah. That's... So meaning there is a, a like, like some inspection, someone that is uh, checking the, uh, or an alternative uh, uh, and NITAC? What is so in this like? case, they have decided... Um, uh, we will discuss a little bit more what, what kind of evaluations you can actually do. But um, in this case, it's an external evaluation. So a neutral body that would look into um, in, into the, the functioning of the night. I personally think evaluations are great. So if they did nothing wrong, <laughs> I think it should be okay with the feedback they receive from the evaluation. Okay, but what would you evaluate? All the processes that were followed, the, the uh, conflicts of interest, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, sure. The composition. Composition. Yeah. Of the evaluation, too. All the data have to be considered to, to support the, the opinion of the night tag should be revised, yes. reviewed. Yeah. So all, sorry, just to understand all the, the inf the data also for each of the recommendations that have been made will, will be looked at. That's pretty, that looks like substantial work. Yeah. Um, what, what exactly is the issue? I think this is not clear. What, what are they upset about specifically? <laughs> so forget about the example. <laughs> It is about uh, trying to discuss a little bit what what external well what, what evaluation means of NITAX and why why would you do such a thing and what 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 kind of things would you look at and uh, to keep discussing. Um, so everyone wants to discuss now. Um, 
Quick question. Maybe you said, said it before. Who elects the actual members of NITAG? I don't remember. Because if we're questioning, you know, also the, the, the functioning, who, who is the... So usually it's not an election. I mean, but, um, that's the kind of, so I think we, we're insisting heavily on one thing. It comes over and over, and that is process. Because NITAG, if you, if you screw the process up, whatever you get out of it, you get the greatest recommendation out, you can put it in the basket. Because basically, um, uh, if, if you cannot prove that you, you have independent members, uh, that they actually looked at the right evidence, et cetera, then forget about it. So that's why it, it comes over and over. So and in your process, you need to define how you want to, to select your members. Usually it's, it's, uh, eventually it's the, the secretary that does the decision, but sometimes that might be a nomination then from a ministerial decree, et cetera. I mean, that really depends, but, um, it's usually something that is, um, it's not an election. It's, it's, uh, but it's, it's an, I mean, in the case of Sage, for instance, it's an open call. And then there is, um, um, a panel put together and, um, and the secretariat uh, basically, uh, uh, builds a list and that list is then, uh, uh, confirmed by, by the hierarchy. And, uh, and, and usually that's what happens in, in, in many night tanks as well. Um, okay. Um, Matt, Matthews. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I would check what are the WHO guidelines for evaluation of uh, NITAX. If they exist, see if they are applicable. If they don't exist, maybe refer to the you GNN. You work for WHO, no? Yeah. <laughs> maybe see the GNN network and see whether other NITAC member chairs had similar experiences with evaluation. And maybe they could share some lessons learned. In the absence of all of that, I would just email you probably. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, uh, the elements that uh, we, that should be assessed is uh, uh, the functionality of the NITAG, how if he uh, follow some process, what is the quality of the data, how we, and also the multidisciplinarity, they have to show that they have different perspectives and also uh, to prove that they don't have Maybe that they have a process to evaluate the conflict of interest because we say that there are, there is a many grade of uh, the declaration and conflict of interest and that there are consequences. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, so maybe just in my experience. Sorry, I'll go there and come back. Yeah, in my experience, I think um, just uh, as a night tag, you have this. Um, a charter, right? Like that's a binding document in the country that how NITAG is formed, the terms of reference, its liaison members and all the process. So I think that document needs to, somebody needs to kind of review the document in terms of how the NITAG was formed, its credibility, its, its liaison with, and its independence, that sort of thing. But that's one. And the second thing is, I think during the NITAG meetings in a country, the minutes are very, very important, right? The minutes of the meeting as a secretary, you do all of that. So, Maybe assessing this this kind of do documents as to uh, how the NITAG was formed and the minutes of the previous recent meetings. This is also important. Yeah, really good points on the minutes and the importance. Actually, it's not done in every country, but um, WHO strongly adv um, advises them to make them public. Um, but it's not necessary in the in in the culture of every country to to do that. But if you do that, there's an enormous advantage that you can, um, you can say, listen, we're, we're not per perfect, but at least we're telling you what we're doing. And that's how we got to the, where we're going. And that usually helps for, for, for building trust. So, yeah. Yeah. I have a question. I don't know. It's, uh, every time there, there will be attack from the media. I, I don't think so. We should, uh, <laughs> request an external evaluation. <laughs> Otherwise, we, sp we will spend the uh, time to employ, to, to commission uh, external evaluation. I would uh, first maybe recommend to have a uh, first evaluation about uh, the SOP uh, for the functioning of the night tag to make sure everything is going well. And after I would choose to have very trained specialists and to face to, to media to, to try to, to answer the, the question and the, the doubt have been raised by the media. 
<laughs> the problem here is that one, it's the government that is being questioned, not the nightlife. It's the government who's taking the decision. So every time the government is going to be criticized, the NITA is going to be put in problems? No. And in other sense, if it's the media, then you do need to have a media expert responding to this. And that is something. If, if you have seen the fights with the anti-vaxxers and the people from CDC asking at the same time in two panels in the television, you can see why we're in the losing part. Because the other ones are... <clears throat> Extremely interesting. The other ones are extremely boring. So there's no sense in in that sense. And here the other issue is that if if the what is being questioned is the composition of the NITAC and its membership and things, that is where the more public this is, the better it has a quality in that sense from the beginning. But in a sense, my worry here would be that you're taking over a fight that is not yours. Um, on the right hand side, anyone else? I, ju I just had a question. Uh, who audits the NITEX? Like, um, who like monitors that things are done in a transparent way? And I, yeah, do on on, you mean on a regular basis? Yeah, uh, like because they could publish the information, but who actually ensures that that information that is published is the uh, um is all what they have for? Maybe, I don't know. So, well, I think it comes, I think it comes back to how you, you define the role and, and the, the, the work of, of the NITAG. And, and usually it defines also, um, how, how they get to a, how do they get to the recommendation and how they, um, they actually get it. Published. Sometimes, actually, it's only published when when it is accepted, etc. But these are the things that you can can set. But this being said, um, an an evaluation and external or internal is actually a, a very valuable tool to uh, um, to try to improve uh, your committee. And I think even in the the, the long established uh, committees, when you talk with the secretary. They know very well that there are things which are going well and others that, oh, we think we're doing well. And then when they actually do the evaluation, they find out that actually, no, um, there are certain things that they're just, um, we're assuming that they were doing and not, not paying much attention. So actually having that, that kind of, uh, to, obviously it's something, it's an additional burden on, on, on NITAX because, uh, it takes time. So in the handout, um, I think you got the, um, uh, the WHO, um, it's, it's the rapid evaluation, um, uh, formula, which is, which already actually, it, it looks like very simple, but if you need to, um, to collect all the information to do that, it, it actually takes time. But um, the um, the benefits is that you can improve and you can actually see what, what doesn't work. And you can maybe also go back to, and to the ministry and say, listen, we're advising you, but actually we're, we're failing here and there because we don't have any resources to do this, because we... We are simply not uh, staffed to um, to uh, for certain things, etc. Um, so, and it it doesn't have to be external to be valuable. And um, so, actually, what uh, what WHO suggests is that at um, at a regular pace, which is uh, compatible with uh, the life of the committee, maybe five years or so. Uh, some sort of evaluation is done uh, to to re and uh, to relook and especially when you when you go through the list there's a lot about the process because it, it's so important but it also looks at at the output obviously which is really the the end products uh, so whether uh, the, uh, the systematic approach is used whether actually um, um, it is based on 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 systematic reviews etc and what kind of methodologies are are used um and then the the last part of it is really maybe the most tricky. That is actually how you. It's good to make recommendations, but unless they are taken on board by the ministry, they are pretty um, useless. And and there's where you you um, the the evaluation helps also the committee to 
to improve that that dialogue with uh, the ministry and with the decision makers who uh, who ultimately take or, or not the, the the recommendations on board. Maybe we should tell the chief health officer not to have an external evaluation of the NITAG, but have an evaluation of the communication team. Probably they have not communicated well about the vaccine. If they have a communication. <laughs> they should have one. When you are introducing a new vaccine, there has to be a communication system. Good point. Yes. Can I just make the parallel with clinical trials, which has exactly the same process. You have to publish your protocol, your monitor. There's a DSMB. It's it's. And it makes it all much more um, credible what you're doing. So I think that's the same uh, as what, what's happening here. Um, what is your advice if we are like many of us after training from ADVAC and was invited to be NITAC committee? Should we accept or not? <laughs> <laughs> there are many challenges. <laughs> well, I think it's if if you are invited, it shows that you are you have something to. Uh, people think that you have something to contribute. That's already uh, on a personal level. I think it would, you know, it 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 feels like a reward. Then obviously, I think there are many things to be considered. First of all, it's an investment in time, and I think Alejandro can testify on what it means in terms of uh, uh, taking taking it serious to be on such a committee. But I think there are always uh, ways to to engage to a, a level that is compatible, and then obviously it has to be compatible with your your functions you have. If you are in the industry, um, it is uh, it is probably not a not a good idea, but you would probably not be uh, be offered that position. But I think in terms of learning experience, it's certainly uh, extremely valuable. But also the networking, with all this networking, you could be a value to the night tag if in case they need an expert or something you could say, well, I know someone in there who could be a, a help us in in that sense. So I think that is a another benefit of having been here and being a member of a night. Uh what what's accepted practice? Are are there honorariums given or are the pro bono? Only expenses. Zero. Only okay. <laughs> they might pay for your trip to go to the meeting yeah. and the well, lunch. They're, they're bad sandwiches. Time. Bad sandwiches. They're not paying for your time. Sometimes they're happy to find a room to get the committee <laughs> meeting. But isn't that problematic? Yeah. Like, honestly, I mean, because we are actually really struggling to find members. Or, I mean, that they come to the meetings, but they don't have time to prepare at all. And I can understand because I can prepare because it's part of what I'm paid for. So it's fine. But they're clinicians, they're seeing patients, even if they're at university. Now there's a rule that they can't do it on the university time because I don't know for which other stupid reason, but that's the new rule because they're not writing publications and that's what counts. So it's really quite hard. And I mean, I don't know, I get the, the idea of being independent, but I mean, these people have tons of experience and expertise, and it seems quite unfair that they shouldn't be rewarded for it. So one key element of this is the secretariat. I mean, we have to make it very clear that we are not asking the members of the NITAC to do literature review, that analysis, grading, all that. All that has to be done by the secretariat, which doesn't solve the problem because in most countries, secretariat is very weak because... I already have a job and I'm asked to do the secretariat of the NITAC. I'm DPI manager. I'm uh, at the Ministry of Health and I'm asked to do that. So th that's a problem. That's a problem that we've seen in all countries, even the high income countries. It has always been a problem, the secretariat. Then when it comes to the members, um, I get you. Most of the members, the core members are usually from, from indirectly government. Hospitals, academics, universities, I would say that probably 60% um, from those institutions. And the, the expectation is that government, I mean, their institutions have, in most countries, have a duty to contribute to the government policy as part of that. So that's usually you even have some mechanism sometimes from the Ministry of Health to compensate hospitals, universities on the time that is dedicated to public health in many countries. It's not the case everywhere. 
Then you have the problem of clinicians. When I come to the night tag, I'm not taking care of my patients. I'm not earning money. So that's why it's very challenging to get the clinicians to be part of it. I would say the one, uh, and I don't have a solution because most of the time there is no budget, but also because we don't want to pay people in the way that we're going to say it's a job. Because then again, trust. People say, those people are paid through my recommendation. So what's the point? So I get your point. We don't have solutions. The only, the only uh, uh, benefit that most of those people will get is personal. Like on, the, on your CV, being a member of a, co- a national committee is always, is always like, uh, as Christoph said, it's an honor to be part of this committee. Most of the countries, um, and you have to work as a secretary to make it at the best level of excellence. So people want to be part of it. And uh, like Sage, uh, Alejandro, the, the, the chair of Sage, it's, it's, <laughs> he had bad sandwiches for many years. One of that no, but 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 you make it very competitive, and you make it very prestigious. That's a Tom Sawyer approach. Yeah, I'm going to let you paint my fence, but that's only for the very special people here. So, and and I think that is something the country should do in the sense of you make it open, you make it competitive, and the people who are in that committee have a status. And that's how you choose it. Otherwise, the problem is that you you do need to have compensation and things, and then you go against the basic principle that you started with, which is that there's no outside influence. And if someone is getting a salary, that's already an inducement. So in that sense, I think that the idea here is you might pay for the expenses if you have the money to be able to do it so that the person can attend the meetings. But if you start putting other things, and we have discussed it, in many in many night acts in the sense um because of the same problem, then it starts losing the principle of of uh, first of all of everybody being able to participate regardless of and the second thing is how do you make it uh, something that people actually want to do or propose themselves to do so last question. I think we will need to move on. Yeah, I was just going to make a quick comment about, I guess, reflecting from experience in Australia where the public really valued um, scientists making decisions and the government really elevated the importance of independent scientific experts driving decision making, be it for the pandemic or for immunization. So I think it just, then government gets kudos and then the universities or doctors, clinicians have to kind of, that, that prestige gets elevated and becomes a vicious a cycle. Maybe one point on that. Um, I think this relationship with the the government is really important. And actually when, when, a, when a country has a well-functioning NITAG, it is a huge relief for, for the, the MOH because it, it says, you know, when I, when I follow those decisions, I know what I'm getting, and and I know that I can, um, uh, I have the arguments for that. So um, actually, it's very much in the interest that the the committee is strong, independent, and and fulfills its its um, its role. Um, but the counterpart is that you need to to give it at least some basic uh, means to to function. I think. But I um, I hope that uh, the coming out of this uh, troubled period, actually, the, the value of the the night tax might be reinforced and and also been yeah advocated for by by the ministry itself. We need to move on. Yeah, um, and we'll 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 have a last scenario and uh, and we'll take a few then. Uh, random questions at the end and come yeah, keep your question for the next uh but it's uh, but it's to come back to that it's challenging uh, we don't have solutions it's challenging uh and and one thing that is key uh is also uh how you present the night tag uh to the public that's what also people you know everybody has an ego everybody likes to be part of an important committee to go on tv and all that so that's also part of it so scenario f the last one. Uh, in March 2016, Sage made a recommendation because of the global shortage of IPV. You may remember that there was no IPV anymore because of production capacity problems. Uh, so Sage made a recommendation. Alejandro, you were in Sage in 2016, I remember. Yeah, you were the chair already. Okay, you were the chair. So the recommendation was to use fractional doses, if you remember. 
Okay, it was uh, uh, intradermal, two instead of one uh, muscular EIM dose. The national program forwards the topic to the NITAG. It was the way to share this information to all countries, crossing fingers that many countries will adopt it because there was a lack of vaccine. So they share that for the, to the NITAG for consideration, but note that this would be an off-label use of IPV. So now we're going back to the regulatory uh, activities. As the chair of the NITAG, would you be bothered to recommend the off-label use of the IPV? As a medical practitioner, would you have a problem to administer the IPV under the off-label recommendation? So you're the chair. What do you do? You, of course, you review the evidences and all that. So, but at the end, would you be okay? If, if the evidences are good, would you be bothered to make this recommendation? And then on the practitioner side, that was the question we were discussing earlier. What do you do? Is it okay or is it not okay? Okay. So I'm not a medical practitioner, so I won't answer the second half. But as the chair, I'm assuming that the SAGE recommendation came with a whole host of evidence. And Did it? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> a whole host of evidence. So as the chair of the NITAG, I would feel quite comfortable following that off-label recommendation from SAGE um, because they, I would assume, had very strong evidence. Because I, can't believe serious, because I trust I can't, I can't believe serious. Okay, let's continue. As a medical practitioner, I would have no problem following that because no SAGE has recommended and the NITAG of the country has uh, recommended, then I won't have a problem. Even if the label says you have to use it, I am one of those. Okay. Yeah, so for me, it would also be notable um, off-label recommendations are very common in this population. It's not a new thing as a clinician, so um, otherwise you wouldn't have anything to treat patients with. We do it every day, off-label recommendation. Yeah, actually, we do more off-label than, uh, <laughs> than on-label, so... Uh, yeah, I would have no problem. No it's problem. actually my my work. Uh, what it's I works do. with yeah. off label. <laughs> okay. I think because in the situation that is shortage, so someone need to to have a guidance. And as a practitioner, I would be more comfortable to have some guideline from me to to say that okay, I do it because they are referring to this other than like make decision at so, their so own. Guidelines day. from who? From, from NITAC. Oh, from NITAC, sorry. Yeah, from NITAC and MOPH. So otherwise, when I was uh, do it, I, I feel more comfortable to have this guidance. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I'd be comfortable in that situation, but I'm curious to hear how, how would a medical practitioner, like the indemnity side, would they be protected? Around Again? The indemnity and the protection. Indemnity. Of We're talking money now. Well, that I mean, isn't that what happens in a lot of contexts where they have off-label use or unregulated? Off-label and money. Yeah, I would very, feel very comfortable as the chair of the NITEC. Um, I think as a medical practitioner uh, also, but of, <laughs> because we do it indeed, but officially you would be required to ask consent for the patient, of the patient because it's off-label. And as a program manager, I would be slightly worried because it hurts a lot more than the IM injection. <laughs> So I don't know about acceptance. And, and one thing more. Take the mic, uh, please. You need a very strong communication strategy for the community because you're not giving them a little bit of a vaccine. You have to explain to them what you're doing. And I think we seldom take that into account. And that's been the problem even with the name. I have been dead against this fractional. It can be a reduced dose, but not use fraction because that means I'm giving you a little because I don't have enough. And in a country that has enough, you get three full doses. And here, because we're poor and there's no vaccine, I'm going to give you a little. And it's going to do the same thing for you. I can assure you that. And that is not that that is something that we don't take into account. So I, I agree with all this and we might be very satisfied about it. But if we don't have a good communication strategy with the community, and it's not just this, it's yellow fever, 
It's uh, one dose of uh, HPV. It's all these decisions that we make that we seldom really build a communication strategy good enough to convince the community. And that just grows the anti-vaxxers on the other side saying we're doing things against them and not in favor of them. Here, here, here. Yeah, I, I think I would be comfortable uh, to use uh, this recommendation. But I'm uh, asking myself, uh, I, I wanted maybe to implement some surveillance with this specific condition uh, in order to get data for the next shortage, maybe for for this vaccine. So we hope there will be no other shortage. In reality, we had to we wait know. several years until the situation recovered. It took we like know. five years, I think, for the, the production to go back to what we needed when we switched to IPV. But, yeah. Okay, don't take it. You want to have data? You want to do some surveillance? Yes, yeah, so I think that's a very good practitioner. I shouldn't have an issue making if it's a policy coming from top, right? So that's one. The second thing is, if it's a sage recommendation, right? Like, is it mandatory for the night tags of all countries to kind of endorse it as an off label? I just say that it's, it's a WHO global recommendation and not have to endorse it in every country, you know what I mean? No, no, there is no obligation. Uh, sage recommendations are for WHO first. WHO members then can decide to, uh, to, uh, to, to apply or not. It was one of the recommendations in this whole IP yeah. uh, discussion. But do the, do the night tags have to reconvene to kind of endorse it at a national level? Of course. Yeah? I mean, because SAGE, again, SAGE recommendations are global, even if they are, they, they are recommendations for WHO and, and for member states. Each member state has to decide what they want to do, and therefore they have to rediscuss. So they probably have to review the data that SAGE provided, any additional data that they would like to consider, they would then have to make a recommendation to the Ministry of Health and to go back to the compensation. If Ministry of Health endorse, endorses the recommendation, of course, then the compensation mechanisms that are existing in many countries are included. Nothing happened. It was fractional doses. Uh, the main concern that SAGE uh, managed was the, the, the protection. Was it like the, the protection here and here? So I can imagine that my concern as a night tag might be that if I endorse the fractional dose, I then get a fractional supply of what I was previously getting. That was the idea. But, but a fractional supply that still is under supplying my country, but under supplying my country for only fractional doses. So is there, is there any sort of guarantee that like if you, if you support fractional doses, you can have enough vaccine to cover all the children in your country. No, no. The idea was that you would cover all the children that you have in your country. But I mean, let's doses. let's be frank and honest. The recommendation was mainly for India and for big countries because they were consuming most of the vaccine in the world. So by having India who are and adopted that, Nigeria also partially. I don't remember each which other countries, but there were a few countries that adopted that. So they ordered less vaccines. Because at one point, the, there was a real problem of availability. Right. Some countries even even didn't manage to switch to IPV because there was no vaccine. And I remember Egypt complaining every year for several years because they didn't have access to the vaccine. But all the countries made this effort. But the, I'm just, I just want to make sure that the sort of guarantee in switching was that you would have enough vaccine. Yeah, vaccine. enough for all the kids of your country with your doing that. Vaccine. And knowing that several countries did partially the, the fractional. They didn't do it in the whole country. I just have a question with regards to how long this recommendation is in place for. Because you, you mentioned that this was for due to a shortage of vaccine. So when does it, you know... It, do, do you, does the recommendation switch back to the original, or is it now that you've kind of demonstrated that this? I couldn't to Alejandro. I think it was it was not like it was because of the situation, but that was also a recommendation that would apply forever. There, there were two things. One was this was temporary, but on the other hand, the studies show that this fractional dose had a much better response than a usual one. So that now became part of the polio program to see how it could be used as, as, as a future part. I, I think the other thing in polio that you will see, and I think Anand will cover, is the use of the new oral uh, 
portfolio to the NOPV, which is a whole new thing, and it's under emergency use, but more data is coming up in that sense, so these recommendations are being adapted. Yeah, so Alenda will present that tomorrow. Okay, so then when it's temporary, though, there is the potential for you to have another meeting to discuss. But you know, the whole discussion was the problem of doing intradermal. Yeah. Uh, I, you're a clinician? So intradermal is is a bit more difficult to do that in IM. IM is easy. Intradermal, you need to train the people. So the biggest concern was not the use of the fractional dose. It was the capacity to train the health workers so they would succeed in doing uh, the right injection. And that was the big concern. But also all of these recommendations need a follow-up in the sense of data. First of all, to see if you need a second dose or a new fractional dose to be able to maintain the, the protection. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, Chris, you suggested like five minutes, five, ten minutes open discussion. Yeah, Question. we have, have a bit of time. Either we can, if you have un, unmet uh, needs on, on the scenarios, um, otherwise any question is fine at this stage. And just to flag you, um, I think it was in your handout again, but if you want to know more about NITAC, start with the NITAC Resource Center. So it's NITAC-resource without s.org. And um, you find everything on trainings, on evaluation tools, on uh, individual NITACs, publications, uh, you name it. Are you tired? It has been only nine days. Well, yeah. About the last session. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yes. Uh, I'm a little bit uncomfortable that uh, usually it's the Ministry of Health who mandates NITAG member to uh, statutes or make a recommendation about a uh, certain topic. Why? And there is, I think it's a Canadian one. He's the only one who had like his own working uh, agenda. And they usually they, uh, they have like, um, a group, a working group on uh, on topics, and then they highlight that uh, maybe the Minister of Health should reconsider uh, his program or consider his... Uh... So how many of the NITAC or all around the world are behaving like Canadian one and... and, uh, and uh, yeah, voilà. So, I, well, I, I don't have the, the figure. I have no idea, to be honest. Ah, okay, I think... Okay. Uh, so what you're highlighting is that some... I don't know how you say it in yeah, English it, and French. It's like the auto saisine where you can. Well, no, it, it, it's more relevant. It, well, I yeah. think eventually um, uh, the, the the Ministry of Health has a strong say in, in in what comes on the agenda. But I think there is the possibility in certain countries that that they might generate within the committee of, of uh, topics they think uh, they should work on. No, no, I was just going to say that. I mean. The NITAC works for the Minister of Health. That's an advisory committee. So they have to serve the, the needs of the Minister of Health. So the Minister of Health should be the one saying, I need you to give me a recommendation for A, B, C, D, N. But of course, as Christophe said, auto I mean, the, the NITAC can decide which topic they want to work on. Every year you have one or two topics like that. You need to let people also discuss topics. But even those, you need to make sure that the Minister of Health is okay. Like, you're not going to discuss Zoster vaccine introduction if the minister already told you we are not, we don't have the money for that. It would, doesn't make sense. So you have to be careful into even the, the choice of those topics. This was just a clarifying question from last session. Apart from flat fractional doses, like you said, rabies and, you know, polio and also not fractional BCG, are there any other vaccines that are delivered intradermally? Yellow fever. Yellow fever. Yellow fever. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, HIV, HIV. Japanese encephalitis. But not routinely, it's all in dose sparing. Yeah, yeah. but all in dose sparing. Yeah, okay. dose okay. sparing. So your question was just on dose sparing, also use off-label. Off off-label, you have plenty of recommendations uh, from NITAC that are off-label. HPV, one dose, it's off-label. Okay. And that is so, IM I, or, or intradermally or intramuscularly? Intramuscularly, so, okay. So the discussion is that most of the time, you know, the label is the is the the output of the pharmaceutical going to the national regulatory agency. They're not gonna go every time an ITAG is saying, oh let's do one dose because yeah, the data yeah. shows that we can do one dose. It's a lot of money. They have to show evidences and all that. So most of the time the label will not change. 
Sometimes they will, but most of the time, the manufacturers have no interest, financial interest, to go back to the. Yeah. So that's why. The easiest example, Matthias, is the the uh, hepatitis B uh, at room temperature. We have been insisting that there has to be a change in the label, and the companies are not interested. What you can do is the purchasing power. For example, Unifed said, UNICEF said we're not buying measles vaccine alone, only measles and rubella from now on. on. You don't produce measles rubella, we won't buy it from you. And that made the change in the label for some of the companies. But other ones are very lazy and very, the process within the natural regulatory authorities is very complicated to change the label. But if you look at the COVID vaccines, many of them are labeled for 18 years and above and we're using them until six months in, the, in that sense. So there is a whole issue related to, to how we use vaccines and the way that they're actually approved for use. Yeah, you have to understand the label is really regulatory things. So every time the manufacturers have to go back, I wouldn't say that they are lazy, like like, like he said, but it's money. It's money. You have to do studies and all that. For what for? They are already selling the vaccine. So will it change what they do? It will most of the time reduce the, the, the number of vaccines they will deliver. They're not lazy. <laughs> okay have we exhausted your questions on your brain <laughs> your brains <laughs> sorry i just have one question about i guess generating generating local data and commissioning research to i guess doing national policies and the role of NITADs and the emphasis on you using local evidence, but also then commissioning. Do they have a role and how much of a role they should have? So, yeah, I think you have the answer now. No, but like in commission, yeah, okay, yes, local, but it's not always available, especially thinking about, I guess, LMIC context or resource limited. How do they, because there's a lot of pressure to do that, but how do they manage? Well, I th- I think it's really, it's really tricky because most of the time, uh, the, the burden, uh, data you, you don't have, uh, really, or at least, uh, you don't have recent, uh, t- targeted, uh, data for, for, for what you need. And then you need to either you can convince someone to spend money on it, but it takes time and et cetera. Or you, you use whatever is available and try to see if neighboring countries, if you can use anything that is, quite similar to your context, or you use modeling data, uh, which uh, so, has its own, uh, or you, you, you make decision without, without having the data you would want, which, which, is, which is also far from ideal. Let's call it uh, uh, not a day because we have other presentations today. <laughs> You're not going to escape just like that. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Christophe. Thanks, Alexandro.